and welcome to The Other Side. My name is Alex Schubert, I'm your host today, and today we have a very exciting show for you. We are talking today about the opiate epidemic. I have two uh, very experienced guests with me today, and we're also going to show you a public service announcement that was produced uh, through a special grant uh, through uh, BSAS, which is, well, you know what, I'm going to let our guests say what it is because I'm not so good with those acronyms. Um, but uh, we will get a chance to see that and talk about it um, a little more after. So uh, thank you for joining me. We have uh, Zach Ficino here um, and Stephanie Medeiros. And, um, We'll talk a little bit about what you guys do, and then from there we will um, talk a little bit more about what's going on in the realm of substance use. So, Stephanie, tell me what it is that you do. So you are a recovery coach, which is an interesting title, mm -hmm. which could mean all sorts of different things. What's it mean in substance use? So a recovery coach in regards to substance use is, I kind of describe it to people as a life coach, because um, it's similar but it's more honed in on the focus of substance use. Mm -hmm. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer service. Um, I think a lot of individuals are familiar with um, a peer specialist. So a recovery coach provides that same peer-to-peer -peer service, but it's focused on sobriety. So what's a, a peer in this? What does a peer mean? So it would mean um, individuals in the recovery coach role would have either they're an ally for recovery or they have their own personal experience to help guide um, the individual or the client or mm -hmm. the patient through their own recovery journey. Okay. So somebody who's a recovery coach has kind of a, a level of intimate knowledge of what it's like to struggle with a substance use disorder, either through family or friends yes. or their own personal experience. Yep, absolutely. So what's the benefit of that over, let's say, a professional who was trained in substance use? So it provides that cultural competency aspect to it. So it provides, like you said, that intimacy um, perspective where they can pull from their own personal experience, whether it's on them as the individual that's going, that went through their own recovery journey or they have a family member that went through it. Um, so a recovery coach is a cheerleader for recovery. It's a cheerleader okay. for sobriety. Um, they're also a resource center um, for the client or the individual. And what's interesting about a recovery coach is you can be a recovery coach through a big agency or you have um, private practice recovery coaches, hmm. meaning um, somebody can hire a recovery coach to go on like vacation with them to help avoid those triggers to either drink or engage in some type of use that they don't want to. Um, so okay. it's it can come from many different perspectives. So now with, you had mentioned life coaches at one point, and life yes. coach is kind of somebody Anybody could be a life coach. You know, they can go on the, maybe mm -hmm. the internet and get some kind of magic certificate or just build themselves out as a life coach. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, recovery coach is a little different. There's yes. more into it. And you can't just, nobody can just walk in the street and say, ta-da, I'm a recovery coach, no. right? No. There's, um, there's extensive training that goes behind being a recovery coach. Um, there's, I think it's over 100 hours of training um, to be exposed to what to expect in the role of a recovery coach, um, to learn things such as motivational interviewing, cultural competency, um, delve into addiction knowledge a little bit deeper, um, ethics. There's a lot of ethical um, situations that come up sure. in working in substance use, so you are really well trained to become a recovery coach. Okay, great. Sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a a shift in kind of how we were more traditionally treating. I mean, we always had 12 step groups, don't get me wrong. Yes. I mean, that's, that was kind of the early model <coughs> of um, substance use recovery. But I feel like it was 12 step groups or, you know, a professional psychologist or psychiatrist, and there wasn't kind of an in-between. It seems mm -hmm. like we found a need for an in-between. Absolutely. Um, recovery coach is definitely one of a new modern role that has come about. Um, and I think it's great. It's definitely needed, um, especially with the demand for treatment that's out there and for mm. individuals to work in the field. Um, and I think it's a great role um, to provide and help like the need of the clients that are going through you know, the throes of addiction or of recovery. Recovery coaches come um, in all parts of the journey through recovery. So you can be in sobriety or you can still be in active use. A recovery coach is useful in all parts of that right. journey. 
Yeah, it's certainly an, an up and down journey, as mm -hmm. we know, and yep. it's not, as we've always talked about, it's not a linear thing. No. It's not all or nothing. No, nope, so absolutely great. not. Great, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have Zach here. Now, Zach's role is a little different. So you are a LADAC and a KDAC, two things which mean uh, nothing to, I'm sure, a lot of people out mm -hmm. there. Um, so first, tell me, what's, what's a KDAC? What does that mean? So a KDAC stands for uh, Certification in Alcohol and Drug Counseling. Okay. And a LADAC is a License in Alcohol and Drug Counseling. Okay. So the difference between those two would be, one of them, the license, is strictly for the state of Massachusetts, the KDAC. If I wanted to go work in Rhode Island, somewhere else, I could carry, carry it elsewhere. Um, both titles are pretty similar in their qualifications and what you need to for prerequisites as far as educational hours, hours in the field, stuff like that. Okay. Um, the process of getting one is similar to a recovery coach but different. There's a lot more educational hours, there's a lot more hours in the field you need to put in and then there's an exam that you pass and that's how you become a licensed or certified in alcohol and drug counseling. So it's kind of a, a next tier from uh, recovery coach. We have recovery coach and then people who want to kind of expand their understanding of kind of the more educational, professional side would then do LADAC, KDAC? Is that yeah, how I understand it? Yeah, it's a little it? bit more clinically focused, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. Um, a lot more one-on-one. -on -one clinical wise, okay. if that makes sense. So now, um, Stephanie was talking about that um, peer piece of recovery coach. How does that fit into the LADAC, KDAC piece? So a, a LADAC or a KDAC role, it's, it's more of, when I worked in the inpatient unit, for example, it is more of a one-on-one -on -one sitting at a desk kind of breaking down the reasons behind addiction, why are you using, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, where the recovery coach is, is almost more of like a bridge into recovery. Um, they're both very directly correlated. Mm -hmm. um, I think that recovery coaching is an awesome piece to have with a LADAC when you combine the two. Mm -hmm. The success rates of recovery go up, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, the LADAC, what I used to do was more of a one-on-one -on -one inpatient setting and more like psychoeducational groups and things of like that, more of an educational piece and awareness piece. Mm -hmm. And then there's also different types of work that I do now, which is more community-based. So identifying people in the community that have substance abuse issues and working with them one-on-one -on -one to kind of get to the bottom of what is causing their addiction, what is causing them to use, things like that. And then working with the recovery coaches hand-in-hand -hand to try to get them the resources they need and the support they need to build their life back. Okay. Well, those are two really kind of fascinating pieces of this really kind of complicated recovery journey. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a one size fits all thing as, as we know in the field that, that different people have different things they need to be successful in recovery. Um, and one of the things that has become evident is that there are certain kind of critical times in a person's kind of recovery story that, that there were moments where they decided they needed help, they accepted help, and they were kind of received, if you will, that there was somebody there who was able and willing to help them to start that, that mm -hmm. most people need kind of that, that not uh, rock bottom as people sometimes think, right? They don't, have to, they don't have to fail, they don't have to lose everything, they don't have to um, have everything kind of fall apart around them. But um, things frequently do get difficult before mm -hmm. somebody seeks treatment. Because treatment's mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those places that a lot of people seek treatment to start is the emergency departments, um, formerly known as the emergency room. The, the people are there um, because they maybe have overdosed or been in a car accident or um, on occasion people just go there because it's the first thing they think of when I need help. Mm -hmm. There are doctors. We also know that sometimes that's not successful, that mm -hmm. sometimes, um, and, and this isn't a placing blame, but this is kind of a reality that the EDs are not always equipped to help people who are struggling with addiction, mm -hmm. partially because they're sometimes used as a way to feed an addiction, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of creates a jaded um, medical staff, if you will. So one of the things that has been a big push recently is to help the EDs, the, the doctors, the EMTs, the nurses to understand better um, 
what a person might need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where they, they enter, they start treatment, and then they go to you guys, right? Is that kind of, would I, is that a good characterization, would you say, to how it frequently goes? Yeah, I think um, there is a lot of stories that start with going to the emergency room. I think the most important um, piece to that is when an individual wants treatment, you have to provide it ASAP, like on demand, right. because things can change within the next day or so. If they're not going to get a bed until next week, things could change. They can continue yeah. to use and not want that bed anymore. So if the motivation is there, the key is to try to get treatment as soon as possible. And what mm -hmm. you know, people first think of is the emergency room. Um, and I do agree that some emergency rooms aren't equipped to help that demand as it's spiked within the past few years. So yeah. it's like supply doesn't meet that demand, essentially. Sure. <clears throat> what some emergency rooms I've seen do is have um, a worker from a local detox agency um, set up in the emergency room to help bridge that connection from the emergency room to treatment so they're not cycling out of the ER. Um, okay. if they want it. So it's right there on demand. Yeah, that's fantastic because there is mm -hmm. that, that key moment as we've right. seen time and time again and there's nothing worse than having a client who wants help and then mm -hmm. they get that, sorry we have no beds or sorry we can't right. help you right now mm -hmm. and then a day later they're no longer at that kind of magic moment where they want mm -hmm. treatment. Um, very frustrating, very it difficult. Is. So the, the uh, PSA we're going to show right now um, like I said was created through a grant to um, kind of show one example, one person's story of their daughter who went for treatment and um, was unfortunately not uh, treated in a way that, that created that moment of getting help. Um, so we will talk more about it after uh, we get to see it. I don't remember exactly how many times we would go to the emergency rooms. I can tell you it was many. I'll never forget the look on my daughter's face, or the tears that formed in her eyes. If someone took the time to understand that she was really in a fight for her life. Picture, if you will, a busy emergency room where an ambulance with a patient experiencing symptoms of tachycardia, dizziness, chest pain, low O2 sats, comes in at the bay. Immediately, there's a convergence of this team of medical experts um, upon this individual, and they employ the techniques necessary for saving this person's life for returning them back to wellness. At the same time, not long after the ambulance arrives, arrives a, a family member or a loved one. And a member of this medical professional team meets that individual with compassionate understanding and describes the techniques that have been employed uh, to help ensure that their loved one is going to be OK. And this staff member recognizes this loved one's urgency, this sense of needing to know um, how their loved one is going to be. And then there's some education around involving this loved one, this family member, um, into becoming part of the person's ongoing treatment and road to recovery. Now picture a similar scenario where a mother and their daughter walk into an emergency room with similar symptoms chest pain, tachycardia, low CO2 stats, dizziness. There's no medical team that converges upon her and her mom. There's no heroic 
interventions that take place. There's little regard for the fear on this mother's face and the sense of urgency that she feels. And yet, another seemingly desperate attempt to save her daughter from the inevitable, inevitable death that looms around every corner. In fact, the only intervention employed for this young lady is a urine screen and several failed attempts to start an IV. We would hope that this time, someone, anyone, would see beyond the disease, or the junkie in Bay 7, as she was so eloquently termed at one occasion, by her treating nurse, who thought such an announcement at the nurse's station was both appropriate and professional. The lack of both engagement and empathy not only left me and my family discouraged and furious, it served to perpetuate the continuation of the cycle of the disease by leaving my daughter feeling dehumanized and demeaned and myself feeling hopeless, helpless, appalled, overwhelmed, isolated, disappointed, and angry. Oftentimes we would leave the emergency room with no treatment at all and no willingness even for a conversation around where my daughter was and her readiness to change and get help or around the medical consequences of prolonged use. Any education around disease model of the substance use disorder would have been welcomed. Yet on several occasions in local emergency rooms, when my daughter and I were seeking assistance, the way we were treated by the medical staff caused more harm than good. The lack of both engagement and empathy served to perpetuate the continuation of the cycle of this disease for both my daughter and our family. And it left my daughter feeling dehumanized and demeaned, and myself isolated, frustrated, disappointed, and angry. Oftentimes we would leave the emergency room with no treatment at all, and no willingness for even a conversation around where my daughter was and her willingness and readiness to get the help that she needed. We wanted someone, anyone, to see beyond the disease or what they believed to be a choice to the kind and loving human soul that my daughter is and was when the acuity of substance use disorder was managed. If we don't change the stigmatization within our, our emergency rooms, which is often the first and only point of entry for so many families and individuals, it will be impossible to make the progress that we are so desperately seeking as we take on this epidemic. And an epidemic it is. We have to be better at recognizing that these individuals are people in need, humans in need, and do a better job of understanding what's driving the issues if we ever want to change the face of substance use disorder. Each patient you serve regardless of circumstances, is an individual deserving of compassion and an individual who has a family that loves them. They are there because they need help, they need support, and they need understanding. And you, in that moment, are the only person who can provide that to them. I hope that in those moments, you will think of my family story and it will help you move beyond the frustrations you feel in your job, beyond the stigma and the generalizations to stand with and support your peers and resist the compassion fatigue that can so easily creep in. In the midst of this epidemic, it can make all the difference in the world. Hi, and welcome back. Um, quite a powerful um, moment, uh, really listening to that story um, and, and what, um, you know, one, one mother's daughter had to go through. And um, I will say that the daughter is um, well on her way with recovery. Um, and she is, I believe, actually volunteering, uh, helping others who are struggling as well. So with our remaining time today, we'll talk more with our guests about some of uh, their experience with uh, emergency departments and, again, kind of the field as a whole and, and where we're moving towards. 
and uh, we will be showing uh, a number two. If you have a family member, if you have a friend, if you are struggling with addiction, uh, please reach out. Uh, the ED is a place to go, uh, and there are many other resources as well. So, uh, Stephanie, during the, while we were watching that PSA, you had mentioned something that I had heard once before but, but don't know a lot about, which is open access. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about that? I used to work at an agency that adopted this open access model, meaning um, this treatment facility provided treatment on demand, so to speak. Mm. Um, there are some detoxes and inpatient facilities that you have to call every day and complete an intake, um, and then you continue to call every day until a bed becomes available. So with an open access model, the individual who is seeking treatment can go um, to the location and get um, assessed by a nurse, assessed by a clinician, um, and they deem like what level of care they're appropriate for, whether it's like a detox, um, dual diagnosis, or the step down, and um, if a bed is available, they'll provide it to them. If it's not, they can either get put on a wait list and call every day until it becomes available, or the recovery coaches will look for bed, um, a bed in alternate um, locations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've talked already about the fact that there is this, this moment in time where somebody is ready to seek help, and that's a very important time. And this is something, obviously, for people at home to understand. Jump on that. When there's somebody who says, I'm sick of this, I don't want to do this anymore, I need help, go for it. Take that moment. Take that uh, momentum, because it's not easy, and it's uh, it's a big thing we're asking of somebody to stop using substances mm -hmm. and to go through all that it takes to not only uh, obtain sobriety but to maintain <laughs> sobriety. Mm -hmm. None of that is an easy journey and, and a lot of support is needed to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately we're still at this place where we were talking this lack of resources mm -hmm. that um, there are plenty of people who are asking for that help and sometimes the answer is we're full. Mm -hmm. There's no beds. There's you wait. You go on a wait list, and and mm -hmm. some of that magic is having that recovery coach there to kind of soften that to provide some interim support. Um, so tell me a little bit about your experiences with the EDs, with working with people in recovery, with um, seeing this process. So I think that the emergency room departments they they do the best they can with the resources that they yeah. have and. And one of the, the biggest struggles with substance abuse treatment is the lack of availability when someone is willing to seek out treatment. I know both personally and professionally, I've seen you know, the, the struggles that happen when you're trying to get into treatment. And the phone calls and call this place, no beds, call back later, call this place, no beds, call back later. So if someone really is that willing at that time, a lot of times they just pop into the ED because they know that's immediate attention, immediate care, immediate nursing, immediate whatever, and so now what I think the, the shift has gone in the field is, I know in Fall River where I used to work, what, the, what they do is when someone comes in for addiction treatment, they'll have a recovery coach go to the hospital to meet with them to try to bridge that gap, to try to get rid of that stigma, to try to take some weight off of the emergency room staff mm -hmm. that might be uneducated, that might, as you can see, still have a little bit of a stigma, that might not know what to do exactly with the person, mm -hmm. to have a professional come in and try to bridge that gap and ideally moving forward that's that's the goal and what they're trying to get to you know right now it's just about the allocation of resources and do we have enough availability for the influx of substance abuse treatment that we really need with the epidemic that's going on mm -hmm. and the stigma is a really big piece still I mean I think the opiate epidemic has really touched on so many lives now that there is a little bit of people are able to relate it a little more to a friend, a family member, or themselves who have struggled with this. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know, kind of familiarity and, and making it a disease with a face, if you will, mm -hmm. makes a big difference. That that one of the things that can happen and, and ED have how many people going through it, you know, in a day you know, you see hundreds of people who are struggling with similar kind of symptoms and uh, as we certainly know in the field when you are detoxing off a, a strong substance, it's difficult and you're not always pleasant. And of course we know that 
it's human nature to gravitate towards the people who are more pleasant. The, the older gentleman who is there because of maybe uh, heart arrhythmia or something, who's pleasantly saying please and thank you and really appreciative, you're going to spend a little more time with than the, um, you know, really grouchy 20-something-year-old female who um, maybe just swore at you as you walked by the room, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we know that that person desperately needs that, that help, that support, um, that throwing him in the category of a, of a junkie, as of a low life, of whatever people are calling them, um, just further makes it so that they don't get the help they need, right? They mm -hmm. overhear that. I mean, we've heard from our clients time and time again some of the treatment they've gotten. Mm -hmm. So with all of that in mind, what do we do? How do we fix that? Really I don't expect you to have all the answers. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I mean, on our part, we try to make them feel as comfortable as possible throughout the process. Um, and that's what we really can do and continue to educate as best as we can that at the end of the day, this is a person behind all of this. This yeah. is like a mother, a daughter, a son, a father, you know, it's, um, they are human and going through real life struggles. Um, so we try to advocate for that as much as possible um, and that they do z deserve treatment. They don't deserve to be overdosing or homeless or on the streets or yeah. going through whatever struggles um, they are going through. So really it's on our end to um, continue to advocate for them um, and try to encourage the individual, meet them where they're at um, and best serve them you know, the best ways we can. So tell me, just to back up a little with, with um, meet them where they're, where they're at. Now that's very much our kind of rallying cry in our yeah. field these days. But I know for the general population, that might be something they're not quite sure what that means. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little more of meet them where they're at? What does that mean for us? So not everybody's going to be ready um, when you want them to be ready, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's um, a model called the stages of change, which I operate on um, through like my agency. Not everybody's going to be in that stage of change where they're ready to take the action and go into treatment um, sometime. So meeting them where they're at is kind of having that education around the stages of change and specifically like using that in ways to motivate them, to try to encourage them to move through those stages to eventually be ready to um, get that treatment that's going to help them. Because if someone's not ready in this mm -hmm. moment, it doesn't mean they're not going to be ready even the next day or right. the next hour. Mm -hmm. no. um, and sometimes yeah. they're not ready. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, family members have to go to um, like more extreme levels and like go through the courts, things like that, because they feel that their loved one is in like extreme danger, or imminent mm -hmm. danger. Um, so there are ways to get help if they're not. Yeah seeking it on their own. And they can go to any local courthouse and petition. Yep. Um, and that is, a, it's a high bar. Um, yes. They do have to be in imminent danger to themselves yep. or others. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard thing to prove, but yes. that is a tool um, that can be successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do know that sometimes when an individual is even mandated into treatment, um, that that can start the journey, that that right. can be the spark. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, the individual still needs the motivation to change, yes. um, and it has to be kind of an internal force, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the external factors do help. Right, the environmental factors can help, and like through the mandated treatment, they maybe can like come to realize that it was like the right um, treatment for them. It happened to a family member of mine and mm. um, they're still sober to this day and it's been Fantastic. like seven or eight months out. That's but great. sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Right. Um, but it really just kind of depends. Right. Well, I unfortunately have to wrap it up right mm -hmm. now. Um, obviously we could easily talk about this for quite a while longer. And I want to say right now in front of a studio audience, <laughs> I think we should do that. I think yes. we should come back together and talk a little more okay. about this because I think this is such an important thing and there's so much to say about mm -hmm. this. Um, and I really look forward to talking to the two of you again about Great. this. Um, so thank you very much for coming on, thank Stephanie you. and yeah, Zach. Um, it's been a great time talking with you guys mm -hmm. and, and I hope that um, people at home got some information that they can really hold on to. And do reach out for help. I can't say that enough. Um, even just to get information, um, give a call, talk to someone. Um, there's plenty of support out there if you need it um, and if you're willing to take it.
Um, so thank you for watching, and this has been The Other Side. My name is Alex Schubert, and I look forward to talking to you all again. Mm -hmm.